All right, well, thanks for the kind introduction. There is indeed going to be everything, but today we're going to focus on the more exciting scaling uh, of training of big data pipelines. So just to give a brief introduction of what this thing is, uh, well, I decided to go to the gym and I downloaded these various apps that uh, I could use to keep track of what I'm doing and I found them to be absolutely terrible. So all I had to do was type stuff in and, and I hated it. Um, so I thought, well, let's, let's build something that will help keep track of what I do automatically. So I don't have to type anything, I don't have to, you know, keep an eye on a whole bunch of devices or, dare I say, use a pen and paper. So I thought, hmm, how do we go about it? Well, the first experiment, really, was to see whether it would be possible to even identify what a user is doing based on some sensors. So back in the days, I had, I had Pebble, so I thought, well, let's record accelerometer data. So I had a, a watch on my wrist, and I did some exercise. And, uh, well, here's what they look like. Um, there's another one, here's another one, and another one, and another one. It doesn't really matter what they are, but even if you look at an entire exercise session, you can probably spot that, well, it seems that three, four, and five look similar. They might be the same thing. And equally, six, seven, eight, and maybe nine is kind of similar. Now, what I thought, looking at this data that I've collected, is, well, you know, we can tell what it is. So surely if a human can tell a difference between a picture like that, surely a computer could do the same thing too. Um, and that's how the project started, and it turned out to be a lot more complicated than, than I thought. In any case, here's how we went about it. We did a few, we took a few samples from a training data set, so all the data that I've collected, uh, we wrote a little program, and we thought, hmm, can we train it? So in this case, we have three different uh, samples, or three different uh, entries from a training data set, and here is how they run in X, Y, and Z axes. And we trained a particular classifier. I'll get to which one it was and what we did with it. So we trained it over 50 iterations, and uh, we looked at the results. And this was great, right? I mean, fantastic, look at it. This is a classifier that makes absolutely perfect predictions on a small data set. So, you know, terms and conditions applying. But we thought this is great. It will work, for sure it will. But uh, when users exercise, there's a little bit of a problem. And the main problem is it's not enough to just tell the difference between exercise and no exercise, uh, to tell the difference between different exercises, but also exercise versus other stuff. You see, if the users exercise, then once they finish, they just held still. That would be cool, because we know that no movement means no exercise. That's great, except the users don't do that. They finish exercising, and then they take out their phone, and they write a text message, and they sit down, and they walk around. So the second experiment was, can we tell the difference between exercise and n other stuff? you know, drinking cups of tea, going to the shops, going to the next weight. We did a similar thing, right? So we have all the exercises as one label and stuff in between as another label. And we did the same thing. And, uh, you know, this is a bit more realistic, but we thought it's still adequate. <laughs> so let's build it, right? We were somewhat pleased. This is okay. Um, so this should all work, right? So, so we built this. Uh, there are a couple of uh, hidden things and a couple of problems that we encountered as we were building the app. One of the earlier versions did all the analysis on the server side, which introduced latency. Now, the latency was actually really low. We, we, we had wonderful code. The latency was in the order of 500 milliseconds to a second. But unfortunately, when you use an app that should react to your immediate movement or to the thing you do or to the thing you see, 500 milliseconds is a killer. It, it's impossible to use. 
Imagine an app that counts the number of repetitions that you do. If it's delayed by half a second, it's, you get confused. The app says you've done three, and yet you've done four, right? And it's actually quite heavy, so you go, what's this stuff? So, so, so we had to throw all of that away, and we had to move all the processing on the phone. So the app that runs on the phone does all the forward propagation, it does all the signal processing. And we moved the model computation to the server. I mean, that's where it, we, it stays there, right? So we have all the data from all the users, and the question that the server-side code solves is, can we discover better models or better parameters for the models that we can then shift back to the phone so that it now recognizes new exercise or it is better at recognizing the existing exercises. So for this demo, we're going to store the test data and the training data in just CSV files in S3. And that's what you'll get if you, if you clone the source code. And the model parameters will write them out to S3 as well. Again, in reality, you would do something a bit more sophisticated than that, but this is a good start. And we will have a sensor like this one, um, which will send the accelerometer data to the phone, and we will do the forward propagation on the model that we trained. And the answer that the phone will give us is, what exercise is this block of accelerometer data? OK. now. One of the reasons we do this, of course, is in terms of computation time, we are going to have to pay for that. Well, I say we, I will have to pay for that. This is going to cost me like 20 pounds, this demo, because we're going to run a couple of high compute machines for about 10 minutes and, you know, costs money. This stuff is great. The users pay for it. It's users' batteries, users' computers. So we want to shift as much to this side as possible. But unfortunately, you know, some things just have to be computed on the server. So, in this entire picture, you had a look at this wonderful architecture, right? But what's missing? Well, what I didn't mention is how to find the best classifier and what this classifier might be. Um, how you train it at speed, that's a bit of a challenge. So, if I have, if all that you have is, I don't know, 10 megabytes worth of training data, great, you know, it will take a couple of minutes on a computer like that. If you now have gigabytes, that's a bit of a problem. Um, now, to make that happen, to actually run the trading pro code at speed, you need to build the right infrastructure. And you don't want to click, you need to write code that builds the infrastructure so you can spin it up and tear it down. And so, the first three we're going to solve in the next 40 minutes. The last one, unfortunately, that's, that's your job. You're going to have to go and collect data and exercise and label. So that's actually quite hard. That's actually really one of the hardest things to do. Now, the data that you can get in the GitHub repository is a couple of sessions of my exercise, so you can get started with it. Um, but if you want to build an exercise app in Anger, this will take months and months of work. Anyway, so well, let's begin with this tackling this classifier beast and what it might be. So we're going to start with a simple multi-layered multi perceptron, an artificial neural network. So, at its core, it's actually a relatively simple thing. You get the vector of inputs, and you have some weights, numbers, just a floating point number, so a vector of numbers, a vector of numbers, you multiply them together, and then you sum them together. And that's what you spit out. That's the result of this one unit. And the unit has some function attached to it. So you might want to do different things. You might want to do uh, just a rectifier, I want to do hyperbolic tan, sigmoid, we'll get to it. But, but in principle, it's not too hard. You combine these into a network. So take my word for it, this network does this computation, which if we pretend that the results are, are integers, it's an exclusive OR. You look, at, you look at it and go, well, this is fantastic. You can, in fact, implement anything, any nonlinear function using this set up using this network. So what's the hard thing? Well, the hard thing is not the inputs, they're, they're pretty obvious, not the output. It's these little numbers. Right, so again, take my word for it, these are the right numbers. But how do you discover them? So if I have only, what are they, five, six, seven 
units, then it's actually relatively easy. You can try every possible number. If, in case of mover, you have something like this, that's a bit of a problem. So we have 1,200 inputs because we take 50 samples per second, so we, give, we get two second windows of accelerometer data, and we have x, y, and z axes. So that gives us 300 samples in x, I'm sorry, 400 samples in x, 400 samples in y, and 400 samples in, in z. So 1,200 inputs, 1,200 numbers. And we have quite a few layers, and what we get out of it is that the outputs where it says score A, score B, score C, that's the number of, that's, those are the different exercises that we recognize. And again, what gets spat out is a vector. It doesn't actually say, you know, exercise A, exercise B, exercise C. It's the value at index zero, the value at index one, two, three. Those are the scores for each given exercise. And uh, what we actually do on top of all of that stuff, right? So now that we have this artificial neural network that takes 1,200 inputs, produces as many outputs as and the number of exercises that we recognize, we then run a sliding window through the, over the input that we receive. Again, two seconds would be too long. Remember, I said, if the input, if the feedback is delayed by half a second, it's unusable. So we couldn't possibly wait for two seconds and then say, oh, well, two seconds later, you've done this, haven't you? Well, we have this moving window, and we move it by 50 milliseconds into the future. And so every slice, we run it through the classifier, and we get the results. So we get, OK, the first window is label A. That's the most likely thing for it to be, exercise A. And then we move slightly into the future time lapses. We say, oh, what's the next one? And the classifier might say, oh, it's A. So we have overlapping A's, so it's really very likely that the thing in the middle is A. And then again, 15 milliseconds in the future, and so on and so on. And so as a result of doing this classification, we get essentially time slices and exercises. What is it? Given this block of data from 0 to this is now, what, 750, this was A. All right, well, let's see how it works. Let's actually have a look at something. So we're going to do Swift, just for good measure. Now, I'm going to do a, just a demo, and just so you see what's going on. So this program will essentially load the accelerometer data. I have some stashed away in a CSV file. Load them up, display what kind of input gets in, and then, of course, make, make the predictions, given a model and model parameters that I've discovered somewhere on the server. So I have this magical file that describes the shape of the network, that describes the weights between the units, as you've seen. I computed, someone gave it to me, right? I, I have it, that's great. And I can do the forward propagation. So, given this input, as an example, so this is 400 values of a particular, of one axis, I think this is, let's see, axis two, so this is the z-axis. All right, brilliant, so zero x, one y, 3z, and these are the actual raw values. That's what's coming from a sensor, and z points in this direction. So I was moving up and down, perhaps. Um, you might notice that the values are actually quite noisy. That's what the sensors do. There's not a lot we can do about it. Strangely, the same noisiness um, comes from both Pebble old version and uh, the new Pebble, color, colored Pebble, as well as the Apple Watch. So it seems that z-axis, so this one, is just noisy. The sensors are noisy. Um, so if, in case you want to build something and you think this is reliable, it, I mean, accurate and reliable, it, it's, it's noisy. It's probably reliable. It's not very accurate. Anyway, so we get this, and then the question is, well, what is it, right? So we have our wonderful exercise classifier, and we say, oh, okay, classify this data. Do the forward propagation. Um, so all the data at the inputs of the neural network, all these multiplications and sums, and out comes the result. And the result is, well, there, there it is, right? So we've done bicep curl from zero to 133 seconds. That was quite a while, right? Test lab data. What followed was triceps extension. What followed was another bicep curl and another bit of triceps extension. That's the entire 
CSV file that I have. If, I, if someone gave it to me as a, as a block, this is what the phone would say. Now, of course, we do this in real time as it arrives. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's actually easy to do. And you might be tempted to you know, crack open Swift or anything else and start writing for loops. You know, for every input, for every weight, do the multiplication. Um, I mean, you could, but, but this, is, this is a parallel thing, right? You have a vector times vector sum. You, you don't want to do this in a for loop. And it turns out that iOS, and uh, I'm pretty sure it's the same thing for Android, you can write these operations, so these activation functions that we had, you can write all these operations as vector calls. So this VDSP, VNEG, VVX, pff, you know, horrible names, but they do this in hardware, in special hardware, in special instructions of the CPU and any hardware that's, that you have installed on your device. And it will do it in one tick, so to speak. It's not exactly one tick, but it happens extremely quickly and it saves a lot of battery power. So for this, if I want to exponentiate every element of this input pointer, I can do it in one call rather than a for loop. If I want to do add, if I want to do a power, again, one tick operations. So it's really, really quite cool. Now, the downside of doing this is these are beasts from the days of Fortran. So you get stuff like the first parameter is an unsafe pointer to float. Now, you should be worried, right? Unsafe pointer is not generally good. It gets worse. C is an unsafe mutable pointer. So, you know, all bets are off, right? Uh, it's because a lot of it comes down to hardware. You have to lay out the memory in an appropriate way, and then you say, okay, Mr. GPU, Mr. DSP, do stuff, and write it to this area of memory. If you get it wrong, you get terrible results, as in just random numbers, you get sec faults, you get all sorts of goodness. Um, so I'm not sure whether Rust would solve it, but you inevitably you still have to come down to interacting with hardware. You know, similar things happen throughout. Anyway, right, so mobile app. That, that's kind of nice, right? So we have, we have a mobile app that can receive the data from the sensors, can do the forward propagation, and it can identify which exercise it is. It does the windowing, it runs in hardware, it saves users batteries, and it's really quick. Fantastic. But I said that someone gave me this wonderful file that describes the network and the parameters. Well, how do I get my hands on it? That's the difficult stuff. If all that we had were I don't know, six, seven units, just like in the exclusive OR example, we could probably try brute force approach, just try every possible number. If I have multiple layers, and if I have 1,200 units, and then I have like 1,000 units, and then 500 units, and then 30 units at the output, there is no way on earth that I can just try every possible float. So I need to find nearly optimal solution. I mean, I would like to find the best one, of course, but I just don't have the time for it. So what I really want to do is apply many different optimization techniques and say, in every step of training, in every iteration of training the, of this neural network, the question is, am I going in the right direction? Do I go up or do I go down? And there are many different ways, approaches that will allow me to discover whether I'm going downhill or uphill. They, each of them suffers from different problems. There are challenges in local extrema, if you think about it, right? So if I have a wavy function, if I can end up in this dip, where the most optimal dip would have been here. Most optimal, that's terrible. You should um, you know, slap me for it. The optimal dip would have been here, right? But I end up here. Well, that's the trouble with uh, particularly these multilayered perceptrons. They are really computationally intensive but they generalize very nicely. So I don't have to do any pre-processing on the input. I can almost throw this noisy input at it and say, give me the result. Anyway, let's try it, right? So what do we do? We start with labeled data. So someone gives me these blocks of accelerometer data and label. So this stuff is exercise A, and this other stuff is exercise B, and this other stuff is exercise C. And then I will construct 
an empty multilayered perceptron. By empty, I mean initialized at, with some, I'll say random, but with some weight. And then I will try to fit the model, this network, to the data by following some of these optimization techniques. And then once I have exhausted my number of iterations, I'll evaluate its performance. Is it giving the right predictions? And I will use the test data for that. So training data, accelerometer data, and labels. Then I will fit the model, and then I'll take the labeled data uh, from another data set. You don't want to do the same thing, right? Um, but they have to be the same exercises, perhaps from a different person, or me again doing them later. And the question I'll have is, is the model accurate? Does it give good predictions, amongst other things? All right, and there's this whole pipeline, right? So I've, I've used big words, right? But no need to worry. Add collection to curated test of training data. This, this is like, you know, wonderful. You're running a gallery. Well, you're not. You just need to look at the inputs that the users are giving you and say, is it even valid input? So we, we ran this thing, and we had a, a whole bunch of beta testers, and we found to our dismay that about 60% of the users are giving us completely wrong input. I mean, you, you'd think this is impossible. And I've, I was struggling to believe it myself. I mean, the user interface is simple. And then we watched the users actually exercise. And they said, I'm now going to do exercise you know, bicep curls. They pressed go. And the thing says, get ready to do bicep curls. So the users went and talked about it. And then they did something completely different. I couldn't believe it. And it's like, you, come on, you said that you were going to do this. And say, I changed my mind. <laughs> ah. So about 60% of the users were giving us completely unusable data. So what to do with it? Well, we threw them away. I mean, not the users, the data. We knew which users were the culprits. And we just ignore it. We didn't tell them, poor guys, right? Because, oh, no, you're doing really well. You'll, here, you'll have a free app. But if you're building a big data system, and machine learning system, particularly with the one, one that relies on human input, be ready to delete stuff. That'll be awful input. Anyway, so, so we have this curated data, something that we all looked at. I mean, we, the engineers looked at and thought, this is kind of OK. So what do we do? Well, we'll have to load it, pre-process it somehow. So if the data is in a CSV file, we need to transform it in some way. We then need to construct and train models on the training data. So we might have different shapes of the network, different models, and we want to try out the best one. We will evaluate it, of course. We'll save the model's parameters, weights, and biases, and we'll save it somewhere. Somewhere that the mobile app can load. And then it can give better predictions. And we'll pick the best model. So the best model would be the completely accurate one. Now, that's probably not going to happen, so we'll pick the one that performs the best. All right, so let's program. So, so we have uh, you know, a whole bunch of boring code that loads stuff and it's, you know, processes command line parameters. What we really want to be able to do is to uh, set up a Spark context so, because the, we will run it in parallel, right? We're training multiple models at the same time for multiple users. So we really want to parallelize it right from the start. So, set a basic um, you know, prerequisites to even run this code. So what then? Well, we have the pipeline, right? And what I said is machine learning pipeline means that you load um, and pre-process the data. So that's this thing. And that gives us the training data set. So now a collection of matrices that represent the x, y, z coordinates with the label, and we have the test data. So that's kind of cool. And then we fit all the models. So we have model templates, which is a collection of these potentially quite good models, and we'll run them for each of them through a pipeline. And then, because this is a demo, we'll do for each print line production code, you, you'll probably want to use some sort of logging framework. Actually, only kidding, this goes into a parameter server. But, 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 for the demo, this is good, right? So what this ends up being is the results, the parameters, and the performance of each model. And the task is pick the best one. 
All right, so how about this pipeline? So it takes a training data set and a testing data set and a thing that can persist it and it can be applied to a model template and it should return a persisted model, some sort of handle that says, I have saved the model parameters somewhere. In our case, it will be S3. In some other cases, you will probably want a bit more advanced mechanism. So again, think some sort of parameter server. All right, so what do we do? Well, clearly we say S21. So we'll extract the labels and, um, and the data because these are, these are tuples, will construct an initial model. So remember, initial model is the multilayered perceptron in our case, initialized to some random, I'll say random, but initialized some initial values of the biases and of the weights. And they are selected at random differently. Every time I create a model, it starts off at a different place. If I, start, if I created the same one every time, well, that, that would be sort of pointless, right? I wouldn't be able to pick a better one, or rather every time I ran this, it would give me the same result. So I don't want to do that. Instead, I then want to, so given that I have an initial model, I want to train it. So a little bit of spark, right? But this should all look fairly familiar, at least to Scala people. So take the train examples and labels, which is a resilient data set that might exist on multiple machines, partition it, group it, create these mini batches, create matrices from it, associated with the initial model, and then fit the model to these batches of examples and labels and return the model that I have now fitted. We want to do the same thing for testing. Oh, evaluation rather. So I'll take the test examples and labels, and do the same business, except the trained model is now the trained model, right? I, I'm now saying, how well does it predict these labels? And uh, we simply evaluate it. And finally, because this is a demo, I have an eyeball and save. So again, real life, get rid of print lines. But the rest saves, stays, right? We have a persister that takes care of saving all the parameters somewhere. All right, one final thing, and then we can get cracking. This thing, which just builds matrices and vectors. Now you might be thinking, well, that's, I mean, what's the big deal, right? It builds a matrix. The big deal is in the library. ND4J is a, a numerical library for Java, it's a, it's a tensor algebra. But the cool, the, I mean, that's cool in itself. But the really cool thing is that calling nd4j.create gives you the right implementation of the matrix. By a right implementation, I mean either for the CPU or for GPU. So when I then say multiply matrix by matrix, if I have a GPU matrices, it runs on the GPU without me having to do anything. I write normal code. But when I say multiply, it can happen on the GPU. If I have a matrix times vector, you get the idea, vector times vector. Um, there is one slight unfortunate thing. I should probably say that very quietly if we're recording. Um, to, those, uh, it's okay. to those of you who are enterprise programmers, enterprise Java, Spring framework, right? So, ND4J uses Spring. Now, okay, as a side effect, it uses one of the utility functions, which will result in you pulling in the Spring Framework as a dependency. I have a pull request, don't worry, it's going away. <laughs> so, all right, so, so that, this seems reasonable. So we should be able to run it. We now have a program that implements the machine learning pipeline. When I run it, its output will be the model parameters. So let's do it. Mm -mm -mm. Now, I could do this. Well, I've just done, right? Um, the problem is, this machine is a bit too small to do it. It has many CPUs and all that, but I'm now running eight Spark slaves because I have eight models to train. And, uh, well, I mean, never mind all this input, right? That's fascinating. But the main problem is, yeah, I've pressed, see, this is, this is the problem. 
you'd expect things to be a bit quicker on this machine. And it's not. I mean, it's kind of nice that I'm getting practically no idle time, but I don't want to wait. And there's a problem in, in context switching, so if you look at how much is spent doing my work, 32%, versus how much is spent doing all the other stuff that Spark is doing, all the context switching, all the network traffic between the nodes, it's terrible. Right? You don't really want to do that. Now, an interesting point here to say is, if you're running, if you're doing some sort of machine learning on a laptop, do it in one process. It's not a parallel job. Do it in one thing, run it on all CPUs, walk away, leave it overnight. Don't try to parallelize it. So running it locally, clearly, isn't going to do anything useful. So let's get rid of it. Kill all Java, that should do it. So flushing all transports, that's all gone. Uh, that's all gone. Wonderful. Now, what do we do? I have a slide, and then, then we'll do this. Training locally, yay, doesn't work. Let's go to the cloud. This is what we really want. If you have a lot of money, no. If you have a lot of data, if you have a lot of computation to do, so tick, tick. If you have little time, tick, because we only have about, what, 20 minutes to go. And if you have a lot of money. Now, you know, in, in this case, it's not going to be a major deal. But when we actually run it on our production data, it takes actually quite some time. And, you know, a run costs us to the tune of hundreds now. Um, all right. So, so, if all of this is true, then we're going to run this. Oh, one more thing before I do. It's empty. Just as a, yeah, I'll refresh, just so you believe me. We have an EC2 account with a credit card attached to it, and there's nothing. All right, all right. So let's create something. Excellent. All right, so we're going to be creating a few things, 10 of them. So hopefully, AWS will cooperate and our internet connection will cooperate. So let's see. Okay, this is now costing us money. We have 10 slaves. We have one master and 10 slaves. So what I need to do now is spend about eight minutes stalling because these slaves will have to be created. We started them from scratch. We, there was nothing. We created these machines, they will get Spark installed, they will get the right version of all the BLAST libraries that implement all the linear algebra functions. They are compiled specifically for those machines. So these are C4, 8x largest, so you know, the biggest machines we can get our hands on. So they come with a particular CPU. We can compile the BLAST libraries which implement, um, they, that goes into days of Fortran, right? Um, the linear algebra operations, you know, matrix time, matrix, vector times, vector, that sort of business. But these can be compiled specifically for that CPU. So I have a particular version that matches that particular machine. So it uses all the instructions that are in the Xeons that are in those machines. If you wanted to do GPUs, you'd pick the, the G4 instances. Um, just a word of warning, they like to kernel panic quite a lot. So there's a bit of a hoo-ha. Um, it's going to be fixed soon, so I keep hearing. Anyway, right, so we started with these machines from scratch. We need to install Spark on it. We need to install JVM on it. We need to install all the monitoring tools. That's, that's happening, right? All of this stuff is, is happening. So let's, let's go back to my slides where I can take some time to stall, and by then, by next two minutes, they, they should be ready. So what we have is this, again. I have code on the mobile that receives data from the watch that you've seen, 1,200 inputs, 400X, 400Y, 400Z. It does all the forward propagation. So it immediately tells the user what's happening. It can give immediate feedback, which is really, really, really important if you're doing something that does stuff that users interact with, that the users see. So if you're doing computer vision, it has to be immediate. You cannot delay things. If it's, ex it's even worse with exercise, actually. Because imagine, you know, the user exercise is actually quite hard and manages to do 10 reps, and the app says seven. Oh, you don't want to be anywhere near that user. Anyway, so that's all happening here. The app 
submits the data, um, the labeled data, so the users will say, what have I done? And it ends up as CSV files in our test and training data set. From that, we have written our little machine learning pipeline thing that constructs um, a multi-layered perceptron, it then trains it, and it saves the model parameters, again in S3, that the app downloads. Now, this isn't production, right? In reality, you want something a bit more juicy. So, the app doesn't, of course, submit stuff to S3. That would, I mean, it could, but it doesn't. The real app interacts with an ACA cluster that holds the, the information about the state. So think about user profiles, uh, where I ask the user, well, what is your, well, a name doesn't really matter, but it's age bracket, weight, height, sex, which allows us to cluster the users and to train models for each particular cluster of users because they move in a different way. And the data doesn't end up in S3, it ends up in Cassandra. So again, we have a couple of machines that store all the accelerometer data. They don't end up as CSVs, they end up as proper column structures in Cassandra. Split into test and uh, train, of course. The model gets trained, so that sort of looks the same. More machines, different kind, but very, very similar. The output, again, ends up in Cassandra. So we don't want to save these files. And the question will be, which one is the best? If we had just CSV files, you know, we'd probably struggle a bit. And the mobile app can request them from the ACA cluster. So that sort of makes it a bit more complicated, but if you compare it with what is being demonstrated today, it's not that terribly different, hopefully. Anyway, so this is what exists, and now I have demonstrations. So we should be in SSH ready state. Okay, that's not good. That's not good at all. Well, let's, let's keep going. We're still connected, so that's good. We'll get, we'll get somewhere. So, next up, I have this S3 bucket, which contains the test and train data set. So, so you can tell, this is all the CSV files that contain labeled data. So, 50 samples per second, actual value of X, Y, Z acceleration, together with what exercise is it. And we use that in our pipeline to actually do all the training. So let's go back to a distributed ML, profit, I mean, this will all be wonderful, right? So let's not get too excited and see how this is progressing. So this is looking good. Machines exist, that's kind of nice, but this isn't. I wonder if, the, if our connection is blocking something. Uh, if it is, then we're in sort of trouble because, you know, <laughs> Um, let's see, could I, could I, let's actually try it out, right? It will reject it because I'm not going to give it the right keys. Yeah, this is, this is firewalled to death, I'm afraid. That's, that's just not happening. Well, no need to panic. I have one question. AV people, can I borrow your ethernet cable? Let's see, right? So I have an emergency option. I'm told that this will work. So go straight to the source. Now, let's see. At least you know it's a live demo. Okay. So how are we doing? Actually, I have no idea how to read all that stuff. Let's disconnect from Wi-Fi and see if we're still connected. Okay, so something is still happening. That, that's encouraging. So I'm going to probably have to restart the script. Um, I mean, that's the, that's the kind of cool thing on, about AWS, right? So they're gone, let's make a new set. Yeah, you stop. 
wait for these to be gone. All right. Let's start again. So this is unfortunate because we've now lost five minutes. Um, but here we go. Okay, here's one. We'll have a few more in just a moment. There we go. Okay. So we have about, according to my timetable, about five minutes to SSH ready test uh, stage. So I'll take your questions in the meantime. I know this is slightly unorthodox, but let's see if this gets to somewhere useful in the meantime. So any questions? Yes, thank you. I was, you know, dreading stunned silence. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, is there any uh, code on GitHub or will it be available? Good, good question. Um, yes, there is a lot of code on GitHub, uh, as it happens. <laughs> okay, okay, you meant for this project. All right, all right. Good news, there is. Uh, so you have the thing that I've shown you, all that you've seen today is here. So you have the iOS app in its entirety, everything from the user interface to the interaction with the devices, we have Pebble, we have Apple Watch with code that runs on Pebble, code that runs on Apple Watch. So you can start with that. Um, in the latest code, you will probably need the latest um, Xcode, so the beta, whatever it is, you know, Steve Jobs reaching from the grave with the hand of death saying, this is deprecated, we won't compile it now. Um, you get the mover analytics, which is the Scala code. There are, in fact, there are two um, things, you can try the Python experiments. So we have an experiment in Neon that you can run locally based on the local training data. And we have the Spark code that you see in front of you. We have the code for Pebble. So this takes you back to, well, I mean, you know, let's, let's look, right? This is C. And a C with very restrictive runtime environment. Um, if you build code for Pebble, you get about 16K of memory for your program and data. So, you know, don't malloc stuff. It's just static bytes that you need to play with. Um, you get no logging, no memory protection. So this is, this is great programming. Um, when it crashes, it crashes. So if anyone's done any uh, embedded programming, the Pebble has a watchdog timer which serves as a kind of an OS. And if you don't reset, if you have a, like a, a loop that doesn't reset the watchdog timer, it will kill your app. And so the Pebble will say, your app has crashed. You press the OK button and it replaces the memory that your app lived in with the memory of the Pebble OS. And you've in effect rebooted. What went wrong? Who knows? Is there a way to find out? No, there isn't. I mean, there is. You, you debug by app log. Yeah, it's pretty grim. So you get that. Um, Pebble, unfortunately, doesn't come with any testing framework, so we had to write our own, uh, which is kind of nice, until you get to, um, let's see if I can pick it up, until you get to the real horror of actually, sorry, of actually using it, uh, which includes a lot of reinterpret casts. So if anyone's doing C++, reinterpret cast is the Magic, I know what I'm doing, just believe me. La, 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 here, have some memory. Uh, so that's, that's there as well, so you can amuse yourselves with that. This is the Akka cluster that I didn't talk about. So user profiles, distributed domain, cluster sharding, multiple JVMs, that's baked in. Many other talks that I've delivered on this. This, I sh this should come with a warning. This is a failed attempt. This is a terrible idea. We thought we'd have a common library that can be, uh, that we can then run on iOS as well as Android. And we've written it in C++ thinking, well, we can, surely we can compile it for Android, we can compile it for, for iOS. And turns out that, well, technically we can, but none of the fancy stuff is available. So all of the vector operations we can't do. And Try as we might, you know, C++ 14, very fancy. 
we're ter I'm a terrible C++ programmer, right? I mean, it's a very complicated language. So this attempted to do a lot of the signal processing, and it ended up, oh yes, if anyone's doing MATLAB, knock yourselves out. Um, so we've done all the code that you've seen in Swift in C++ and really don't do it. It's a terrible idea. And again, it's full of this sort of horror, which I suppose is Swift's unsafe mutable pointer, so it doesn't really matter. You have to do this dirty stuff at some point anyway. So that's also available. And final thing that's available is mover open training data. So there's a very small subset of the training data. So if you want to build something completely different, say you don't care about mover at all, you want to try your own exercise data analysis, there is some data that we've collected that you can, that you can try out. All right, so I've stalled enough. Let's see, if it failed, it failed. And I will thank you for your attention, but hopefully it has, oh, that's good. That's good, that's good, that's good. So we're now installing everything. Okay, not too bad, not too bad. Five, oh, wow, that's good. Okay, R Studio, who's doing R? Yay, there you go, it's a horrible language, isn't it? Uh, nevertheless, you get support for it in, in Spark, and you can connect to this Spark cluster using R Studio and actually write your little R experiments and query the real data, which is actually quite useful, even though horrible. So this is not looking too bad at all. They, it will, when it finishes, it will have some errors. That's expected, so no need to panic. Okay, okay. That's, that's looking good. That's looking pretty reasonable. Almost. It's going to start Ganglia, it's going to start the Spark Master. We'll see how many CPUs we have, and we should see that we have one master and 10 slaves doing nothing at all, really, because we've only just prepared this infrastructure. So, nearly, come on. I mean, these are the biggest machines that we could buy, so I would expect them to be a bit quicker than this. Um, but, anywho. All right, all right, all right. I have a question. Yes, go. <laughs> so you mentioned that so the mobile does a form propagation, mm -hmm. but uh, you need new testing data. So is the phone constantly sending data? Right. So how much data are we talking about? That's, that's a good question. So. You can, the users can opt in to receive the, uh, to send the data, and we are talking a kilobyte per second per user. So, you know, in, in a small app, it's not a massive deal, but in a larger system, or if you have a lot of users, it's actually becoming problematic. And second problem with this particular app, and with exercises, is that users exercise at a particular time of day, so we have this massive surge in the morning, and then nothing during the day, or almost nothing during the day. And then we have, again, massive surge of input in the evening. Second thing, if you're building this kind of app, you should consider is you are storing biometric data. So what we have done is taken a similar approach to you know, um, ad tracking. So we have uh, the ability in the you know, full-blown app to reset biometric ID. That's the that's a big word, right? But essentially, we generate a new GUID for that user, so if you're a user, okay, so we're, we're good, right? Don't worry, this is expected. So we should see that it's sitting there doing not much at all. Yay, good, let's see Spark. So we should see 10 slaves, one master, idle. That's kind of cool. We're going to submit the job and I'll keep, get back to your question. So. Cluster submit, and it needs the, the address of the master to submit it to. Goody. All right. So that's going to be happening. Do you know how long it'll take? Roughly? A minute? We can finish. I mean, you <laughs> can, we can all have a look at it and, and uh, stare in awe how, how this is sitting there. So if you're building a thing that records biometric data, you need, I think, to give the users the ability to disconnect. It's going to hurt you because you won't be able to reliably connect the training data. But it's good for users. It really is. Um, 
I'm surprised that not many people, or that I'm surprised that many people opt in to share their data in all these exercise apps. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, I'm frightened. Anyway. I think we uh, sure. have to cut the wire. Figured if you don't mind, the last question. Uh, okay. Uh, so the question is, you know, uh, you probably heard about these Garmin devices. Mm -hmm. So could you do a little bit of comment on that? Because uh, for those who don't know, I have this Garmin Swim, and the battery lasts for a year, and it's quite good at predicting a lot of stuff, like yep. my swimming style, the number of laps that I do, number of strokes per lap. Yep. So what's... Could you briefly comment, what's this architecture give me as a user? if I opt in for your uh, biometric data share? Sure. Um, it gives you the ability to recognize and classify any kind of exercise. So that's the really, really powerful thing. We can train it to recognize nearly anything where we get movement from a sensor. So of course, if you're doing exercise where the sensors don't move, we're stuck. But we can classify swimming. We can classify you know, mountain climbing. We have an experiment. Even more powerfully, and uh, this is something that's you know, really in the early stages, we are trying to help people with uh, physiotherapy. So we can, because we can train models specifically for a, a group of users or even specifically for a particular user, we can assist that user with exercise they do for physio. So we can train it to do you know, a particular movement. And then when they, the user repeats the movement, we can track that again and report it to, to the physio people. The challenge with this... Would you be able to tell me that my swimming style needs some improvement? Oh, that's a really good question. No, we can't. <laughs> we're, we're really working on it. We're really trying to figure out how to do it. It's a very good question. What is good exercise? I mean, what is this notion of good in exercise or physio? We don't know. Um, it would be great to know. Right. I'm sorry. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, can you all please applaud Jan? Thank you.